So in this video, we're going to look at uh, multi-step methods. The last thing uh, you would have uh, looked at, we have looked at actually, is the Runge Kutta methods for solving first-order differential equations. Now here, we're still uh, the same objective. We want to solve first-order differential equations. So we're still trying to solve y dash equals some function of x and y with an initial condition y x of 0 equals y 0. But we're going to take a different approach. The different approach, the approach is going to be different in this manner. So far, we've been using Taylor's, um, Taylor's series to look at how taking more terms in the Taylor series can, reach, can lead to a higher order method. In this particular instance, for multi-step multi -step methods, so the basic idea changes right here, which is, in essence, the opposite of differentiation is integration. So when we want to solve a differential equation, especially a first order one, just like the one we see here, the obvious, the most obvious way to do it is to integrate both sides. But what if we were to integrate both sides dx? And when we solve this, uh, when, well, the left-hand side is reasonably simple. It's uh, just going to be y at xn plus 1 minus y at xn. And that's equal to this integral, xn to xn plus 1 of what you see. And of course, using the shorter notation, we can lead, this can lead to the following simple straightforward result, which is this. Now the recipe is different. So before we were using, of course, a Taylor's uh, series to develop methods. Now we're going to use this idea to develop methods. If you see here, the key lies in this integral. So the, the missing piece is this integral, really. Uh, how we do the integral is what can lead to the different methods. Now, of course, the point is that if we can um, integrate f of xy, then there is no need for a numerical method, clearly. However, we are looking at those particular problems where the integration is challenging or not possible. So numerical integration is necessary. Now, we've looked at um, numerical integration in significant detail, uh, starting from the Newton quotes, for instance. And the Newton quotes, basically, we when we developed the trapezoidal and Simpson rules, we clearly saw that the way to do that was to approximate the function, in fact, as a uh, polynomial. Now, before I get to this, let me let me try to uh, show you what. What is that? What is it that we are actually trying to do? In the sense that when we solve a problem, we're talking about something like, say for instance, this is a solution to a problem, a numerical solution to this problem, and it has you know certain points that we've calculated using the numerical method, and of course we can develop a graph from that and so on and so forth, not a problem. But suppose that this, in fact, this point here is the point uh, yn, um, which means y at xn, in other words, oh, well, wait a second, sorry, pardon me. So that's the point xn at xn, and that is the point xn plus 1. But if we, what we've been doing now, when we are, when we were looking at the Runge Kutta method, what we were doing was we were looking at evaluating the derivative at these two points only, xn and xn plus 1. And what we started to do, basically the higher order Runge Kutta methods were, um, okay, well, what if we split the h in by multiplied by alpha, a fraction, and therefore start filling in more and more points inside here, uh, inside this uh, region, and keep, keep splitting it into, into smaller and smaller parts. And that would lead to more accurate a higher order method. What if we were to say that when we numerically actually integrate, these other points that we are not really thinking about are also available? Or at least we can consider them to be available. If we were to consider that they were available, meaning that this point would be, for instance, xn minus 1, this would be xn minus 2, and this would be xn minus 3, for the sake of argument. If we start taking some of these points, in other words, points from the past, 
then that could possibly lead to an interesting new method. And that is exactly what we do here. Because if we're going to fit a polynomial to f of xy, which means we're approximating f of xy, we need points on f of xy. These numerical values, in fact, are providing us those. This is standard interpolation. This is what we've done before. This is exactly what we were doing before, is given a, a, given a set of points, x and y, uh, approximate a polynomial that fits that data. So therefore, if we were to use, for instance, some of these uh, points in the past and the present, the xn and xn minus 1, for instance, we could easily develop uh, an approximation to f of xy, which would, we could then integrate, because polys are easy to integrate, and that would lead to a possible method here. So with that in mind, let's try to see. What we mean is, for instance, if we were to use the zeroth order polynomial, okay, so the zeroth order polynomial is just a concert, just a constant, sorry, okay, so it's a constant. So if we use that, so if we were to use a zeroth order polynomial, the first point, and we were to use x n y n, for instance, the present point, that would be, that would mean f of x n y n. And th this would indicate that, of course, then what we do is from now on, when we say fn, that is the same as saying f of xn, yn. So just to shorten the notation. Now, xn plus 1 minus xn is the fixed h that we've been using. Now, if you look at this, that's our Euler. That's Euler's method, in fact. So here, now, the same... This new technique, this new idea, which is not so new in fact, is in fact generating a good method for solving differential equations, one we've seen before, Euler's method. Primitive, simple, but it is generating the method. So let's go to the next, uh, the, the next order polynomial, which is a linear. So a linear poly, what would that give us? Well, a linear pol polynomial, and using using the points fn minus 1 and fn okay two points here of course we used just fn now if we use fn and fn minus 1 the simple lagrange concept would give you uh, well easy polynomial fit here you could do it by so many ways by just fitting the line to fn minus 1 to fn easiest to see here is fn so one thing I didn't mention here is that here, when we, we we're going to approximate f, okay, by plus 1, so we end up with this. Now, if we integrate this, which is very easy to integrate, because remember, fn, fn minus 1 are all, and xn are all constants. So when we integrate this, this simply goes to fn into xn plus 1 minus uh, xn, which is just h, so it'll just be hfn, okay, plus you'll have fn minus fn minus 1 over h, and that will be multiplied by x minus xn squared over 2, and um, uh, this will be evaluated at um, between xn and xn plus 1. And that's the, the whole thing altogether. Now that, uh, when I put in the xn plus 1, xn plus 1 minus xn is h. So it's just going to be h squared over 2. So let's move on. So we'll get, so, and the other one, when we put the xn in, is just 0. So that's all we have. And uh, this h uh, squared, of course, this and this h squared will just cancel. And if you see here, the h over 2, fn, and the, uh, this one here, the h over 2. So this will end up giving us just yn plus um, h over 2, okay, into 3fn minus fn minus 1. This, let me box this. This is, in fact, the second order Adams-Bashford method. And this basically introduces you to the Adams family. 
suppose if I want to calculate this, how am I going to calculate fn minus 1? Because the question is the following. When I'm practically trying to solve this problem, if I want to calculate for the sake of argument, if I want to calculate y of, for instance, I, I will start with uh, y n equals 1. I can't start with 0 because I can't have a negative index. So y, uh, that would mean that my first value would be y2. And y2 is equal to y1 plus h over 2 into 3f1 minus f0. Here's the problem. The problem is f0 is not an issue because f0 is just f at x0, y0. And I have f, of course. And I have x0 and y0 because those that's the initial condition. I have y0 and I have x0. I can generate as many x's as I want. That's easy. X, xn is just um, x0 plus uh, h. Not a problem. The issue is the y. Now, I do have y0. So I can get y0. Uh, sorry, from Y0, I can get F0, no problem. The problem is, where does the F1 come from? Not only that, there's another issue. Where is Y1 coming from? So these two are problematic. Where am I going to get F1 from and where am I going to get Y1 from? Now we need an initial guess, in fact, for the F1 and Y1 parts. Because they will go together. Once we have Y1, we have X1. No problem. But the problem is, how do you get it? Now, this is not a big issue because one can use any method available to us. All we need is one value, just one value. So one can use, for instance, Euler's method. Not a great idea. Why not use a, a Rangakara, a second order Rangakara, for instance? We can use an RK2 to calculate F2, F1, and Y1, of course, okay? Well, we'll use it to calculate actually Y1, and that Y1 will give us F1, easy. Once we have that, we feed it into this, and then the method just keeps going. It, it can easily generate, because look, what happens next? Let's see what happens next. Once we have, uh, uh, the next one we're gonna be looking at is Y3. Y3 is gonna be Y2 plus H over two, 3f2 minus f1. Now, we already have f1. We have f2 because now we have y2. Just calculated here, which goes in here. So, you see, everything is now available. And as we keep going further on to the iterations, the, there, is no, there are no, problem, no problems. So, what we're saying is the RK2 in this case is like a, a starter. Okay? It's like a starter. So, you want to... Uh, you know, it's like, just like starting a, uh, an engine, for instance. You know, you use the, 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 the basically, you know, when you, you have a motor, uh, a motor you, you pull the string on the motor, or if you're uh, your lawnmower, for instance, once you pull the string for the petrol lawnmowers, once you pull the string, that's it. You don't need to pull it again. The engine starts and it just keeps going. So the role of the RK2 here is just that of the starter. It's just there to start the process and then it goes on from there. Uh, uh, keep track of the error, the local truncation error, the local truncation here is order h cubed. So the local truncation error is order h cubed and the global, okay, and the global error is order h squared, okay. So this is a order h squared method, um, essentially, that we're looking at. So this makes this particular method a two-step method. So you have the first step where you use the initial uh, RK2, for instance, to calculate uh, this value. And then you use, for instance, the, um, and you continue with the Adams-Bashworth. Okay, uh, AB2, that is, uh, or Adams-Bashworth second order. Let me just quickly show you the Adams-Bashworth fourth uh, order. So this is the Adams uh, fourth order Adams-Bashworth explicit method, as you see here. Um, one thing I want you to note is, uh, it's quite important for you to note this, is here we just don't have fn minus 1. We have fn minus 2 and we have fn minus 3. So if one were to use, for instance, um, as we did, as I mentioned, as I rec recommended, the starter would be the RK2. So here one could use as a starter. But 
you have to keep in mind. This time you're not going to be using the Rangakara for one value. Okay, so in order to, for instance, calculate the first iteration of uh, using Adams Bash for the explicit method, so you would use n equals 3. The smallest n you can use is n equals 3, which means that you'll start with a y4. So y4 is going to be y3, h over 24 uh, into 55 f, uh, n is 3, remember, 3 minus 59 f2 plus 37 f1 minus 9 f0. Now, it's only the f0 that we will get from x0, y0, the initial conditions. f1 means we need to calculate y1 from the Rangakara fourth order. We need f2, so we need y2. We need f3, so we need y3. This means, and of course y3 here as well, so this means that we will have to use the Rangakara fourth order, for instance in this case, to calculate y1, y2, and y3. Once we have those three, we have f1, f2, and f3, and then we feed that into this, and then the method will take over. So y5 will then require, we'll already have the y1, y2, y3, and now y3, y4 is generated uh, from this um, Adams Bashford, so it's a new one, it's, the, it's an updated value, and the previous values y1, y3 and 2 will be used now, and 1, y0 will be dropped, and so on. But as I said, uh, we can, the, the Adams Bashford will then take over from there, that point onwards. Okay, so we'll stop here. These are the, this is, so this is a two-step method. We haven't reached the multi-step part of it. In a way, it is a multi-step method, but why, don't, why wouldn't we just call it a two-step method? Because there is an improvement possibility. Because the good thing about Adams Bashford, uh, this Adams Bashford that you see here, is it's fast, it's efficient, but it has an accuracy issue. And that accuracy issue is the same accuracy issue we faced before when we are using polynomials to approximate the function. Uh, not only that, but what we're really doing is we're using past values so we're using fn, fn minus 1, fn minus 2, and so on. These are past values to predict fn plus 1. Now, fn plus 1 is outside the range of values that are being used. When we do that, that's an extrapolation. We all know that extrapolation obviously leads to error when we extrapolate uh, the interpolated data. So we use the interpolated data to extrapolate the result. There is a chance of higher error. So in the next video, we're going to look at what are called implicit methods, which try to correct this issue. Thank you.